Well, good morning. My name is Mike Bryan. I'm a volunteer with the Southern Arizona VA, uh, working on the Veterans History Project on behalf of the Library of Congress. And we're, uh, we're at the home of Bill Hosmer, a uh, pilot, Air Force pilot, uh, in his home in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, today's date is Tuesday, July the 5th, 2016. So, Bill, why don't you give me your full name and uh, your birth date? Okay, it's William John Hosmer, and I was 101730. 30. 1930. Yeah, I'm going to be 86 you're, in October. <laughs> you're a, you're the, one of the young ones. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, why don't we just start in the beginning here too? When I was reading through your uh, the autobiography section there on uh, the Friday Pilots, you were talking about your life as a youngster and. Uh, Flying always seemed to be something you were, well, first of all, it was about your education. You were talking about wanting to go to West Point. Yeah, I wanted to do that uh, when I was six years old because I had a, an uncle that graduated and came back to our little hometown in his nice uniform. And I said, that's what I want to do. I was six years old that year. And he came back later uh, twice in, uh, in airplanes and landed at our little airport in Dunseith, North Dakota wow. on a little grass uh, strip. And uh, one of them was an O-47, I believe, and it was an open cockpit, high wing, uh, single wing. And then he came up again later in an airplane that looked like a T-6. And I knew then I wanted to also fly, because the sound of that thing, he buzzed our hometown a couple of times, and I said, this is exactly what I want to do. He was your hero. Yes, he was. <laughs> yeah. So that, but your dad saw that in you. Well, he understood it, and he checked with me every once in a while. When I was seven, eight, nine, ten, what do I still want to do? I want to go to West Point and fly airplanes. I didn't really understand the full implications and anything about the school. I just thought, boy, you get to wear a uniform, and after you're done with that, you get to fly. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I found out the first day at West Point, I didn't know why in the hell I ever wanted to come to this place, because it was four years of agony. <laughs> <laughs> That's the price you had to pay. Well, except for the good people that I met. My classmates became the most important people in my life to get through that place. I was academically not smart. And I was toward the end of the class, fighting academics all the time, dumber than dirt. <laughs> to make a, a long story short. You know I don't believe that. <laughs> but your dad uh, moved you to your grandparents? I, yeah, I lived with grandparents and an uh, aunt and then an uncle. So I spent four years away from home, the high school years, and graduated from a, a good school in Minneapolis, Minnesota, living with the family of the guy that got me into the interested in going to the academy, and he was still in the Air Force, and he was getting an advanced degree, and he ended up getting a doctorate through the Air Force education program with, with uh, civilian universities around the country. as a program that uh, everybody takes advantage of if they're academically Oriented, which I was not, yeah. but, but he was. But there was a reason that he, your dad. Uh, well, yes, uh, uh, he he knew what I wanted to do, and he sacrificed money-wise uh, my living with grandparents, and I was paying, he was paying rent and food costs and things like that throughout four years, and uh, I was always grateful for that because I, I wouldn't have been able to pass the entrance exam without that. So you were able to go to a different uh, school with your grandparents when you were with your uncle so that you could get a better education. I did. So you could get into West Point. That's right. And, and my little town didn't even have anybody that knew how to teach algebra, for example. And that's just the beginning of the math challenges that come up mm -hmm. later. So the schools that I went to in uh, Seattle, Washington, but there were two of them out there I went to, and then it's in Minneapolis, Minnesota got me, you know, the maths all the way up to the beginning and the trig trigonometry, the start of it. So I was better prepared just by having left my little hometown. That was pretty observant of your dad, it seems. Oh, like. yeah, and, and uh, it was, I left home at 13 years old, uh, if you can put it in those terms. But my mother was uh, sad about it, but she supported the whole thing. She knew what I wanted to do. And they were both at my graduation, so I was glad that we got there. <laughs> okay. That's, you know, when you pick out something you want to do at six and you still want it when you're of an age when you can actually do that's it. That's right. That's, that shows pretty much focus. I really was focused. I, I didn't think of anything else. 
Now, what did you, what did your uh, what was your family? Uh, your dad was a, a mail carrier. Mail carrier, and he had a, a business, a small store. We, it was actually a general store. It had uh, clothing, groceries. Mm-hmm. Had a ladies' department. My mother worked uh, on the ladies' side, dresses and things. Yeah. They used to go to Minneapolis and and order their things for the fall uh, sales business and summer and spring. And so I was living in Minneapolis. So I got they'd come down there while I was living with this brother of his, my uncle, uh, and so we, we saw each other a lot during the last two years. Yeah. Well, talk a little bit about uh, West Point. Just what, what was that experience like? I mean, there's a lot of discipline. It's four years. You've got yeah. to stay focused. I didn't have any problem with the military side of it. Uh, I was quick to learn the, the, the marching, the drill with the, uh, the weapons, uh, the the manual of arms and things like that that we did. Uh, academics was my big challenge because it, it was a it was an intense. It, you know, we we uh, recited in every class every day. You you didn't fake your way through a period of you, you were reciting. You'll be somewhere in that you're going to be you'll be at the blackboard solving uh, problems, the mathematical problems, or doing tests. Just a quick test today, folks on uh, maybe uh, the der- uh, derivation of the quadratic uh, formula or something like that. So we had to get that done. And it was that way every day for four years of, of academics. And during the summer months, we trained at the academy, and we also did uh, trips. Uh, we went to, on an Air Force trip, spent a month going to different types of uh, air bases, uh, the uh, Army, uh, we went to the artillery centers, the infantry centers, we went through jump training all the way through, but they wouldn't let us jump on those days because they were put too much money on us, I guess, because now the cadets are, are jump qualified by the time they graduate, if that's their, their branch of choice. So we didn't, we didn't get to do it. They did all the stuff for, for three weeks, uh, doing push-ups and stuff that the drill guys wanted us to do, but they wouldn't let us. We went up on a stick with real Army guys that did jump, but they stopped us when we got to the door. Uh, they wouldn't let us go. Well, that was back before the Air Force really had an academy. Well, that's right. Uh, uh, they started in. Uh, my, I have a cousin, the, the, uh, the, the oldest son of this uncle that I admired, is a valedictorian in the first class of the Air Force Academy, the class of '59. His name is Hosmer. His name is Brad. He retires a three-star general. Uh, he was a general officer material. I wasn't. Holy smoke, it runs in the family then, huh? So he was a valedictorian in the first class of the academy. That means he was the very first Air Force Academy graduate, and I've always been bragging him up about that because he lives in Albuquerque. He's a good guy, got a family, grand, he's a grandfather now. Yeah. Anyway, that's just another sidelight. But uh, You said he was a Rhodes Scholar, too. He is a Rhodes Scholar, uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty impressive. That, that was really impressive. <laughs> did, you used, did you used to babysit for them or something? I did. Yeah. Was... I, you know, I used to, uh, I used to bring my chemistry workbook home from high school, and I'd throw it on the table, and I'd go out and run around with the guys, you know, till dark or something. And then yeah. I'm going to do that later. Well, he'd get into the chemistry book and start filling out the blanks, <laughs> and he was in the sixth grade. <laughs> That's incredible. That's incredible. Yeah. Well. <laughs> so, it, it, sound, it sounds like he made the best use of everything that was available well, he's, to he's, him. I'm very proud of him. So uh, talk a little bit, okay, so you, you're going through, you're out of high school, you go into West Point, you're coming out of there and you select the Air Force. Yeah. Um, you were one of what, two in that class that selected the Air Force? Uh, the, uh, fortunately, the one quarter of our class in Annapolis could go to the Air Force. Uh-huh before the academy was established. Okay. So I was uh, almost in the bottom of my class and I was sweating out the choice to get to the Air Force. And if I hadn't, I'd have gone the infantry because I was, I was good uh, on that part of the uh, operation. Yeah. And I would have been okay with it, but I'd have been very disappointed. Uh, but I lucked out. The last guy in our class got to go to the Air Force. Wow, that's awesome. That's right. Well, talk a little bit then. So you're through West Point, and then you go into training. I'm, I'm guessing. That's right. And we we met. We merged with the Annapolis guys. We, we were student officers, and often we'd be at a base, and some of our students would be cadets. Uh, foreign. We had. Uh, I had two Frenchmen and a Dutchman 
that I flew with in primary, for example, mm -hmm. but and they're my classmates and the naval guys, they all were in the same group and they also had these fellows they were flying with. And then we went through the progress from primary to basic. And at basic, by that time, I knew I wanted to go to fighters, so I went to a primary base that led you into fighters. Some guys went into bombers. So they, they uh, went to a different set of bases than we did. Okay. And then we went to Nellisk. I wanted to fly the F-86. And so that's where I went, and uh, a lot of us went with us. Uh, 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 and uh, it's mentioned in there, but we had a carpool that going to work the day that I crashed, and that's in the book. Yeah. Uh, th three of us, two of us were West Point guys, and one was an Annapolis guy. I crashed at 9 o'clock, uh, at 8 o'clock, and the uh, Annapolis guy had an accident at noon, and he broke his neck in the course of that thing, so he was all through, and he left. I never saw him again after that. He, he was paralyzed for the rest of his life. Uh, and that's the way it was in those days. It was a, uh, and somebody else uh, lost both wings on a pull out of a rocket pass uh, a week later. And he was an Annapolis guy mm -hmm. that was in our group, and uh, we just lost a lot of people in those days. But that was acceptable. It was uh, the attrition rate was ex okay at F eighty six bases because mm -hmm. that was a the, the way they taught it. Talk, explain what happened with your when when you had your issues there. What, okay. What, what, uh, what happened? My, my uh, instructor pilot is, is before I took off. First of all, we flew with a chase pilot. They they were single seat airplanes, you know. Okay. So you were he was chasing me in another airplane for two rides on a Friday, and they went just fine. We did some stalls, did a couple of maneuvers, and came in and landed. Did some low approaches and then landed. He said you did a good job. So then that was a weekend, uh, Labor Day weekend, and. So I'm scheduled to fly Tuesday the next week at 8 o'clock in the morning. And um, coming uh, back from uh, a solo mission, I, I came back and was entering traffic and uh, I got a call that said, Solo over the brown spot, uh, could you do a 360? I've got four, we're real low on fuel. Now brown spot is the airstrip? It was a reference point that we entered uh, into okay. the traffic pattern. Okay. And so I did that, and then I lined up again in a flight, said, I got three airplanes coming in, we're low on fuel, uh, could you do a 360? So I let them through, and then I said, I better get this thing on the ground. And I had 250-something. <laughs> uh, we had pounds, if it was an uh, F model, if it was an E model, it was in being gallons. Well, I had 250, and I said, it must be pounds, because I've been up here a long time. So I better make it without any going around, because it took about 250 pounds to, of fuel to make a pattern, a complete pattern. So I entered traffic, and my instructor pilot had told me before I took off, he says, I'm going to be out in mobile control out at the end of the runway, listening on the radio and watching you, and if I see you add power on downwind, I'll see the black smoke coming out. That's a flunk ride. So I said, okay. So I flunked the ride anyway because I crashed. <laughs> so <laughs> he wanted me to do Flunked it his way. Time, huh? yeah. So why, why would that, why, if you're accelerating, why, why would that flunk you? Pardon? If you were accelerating and he saw the black smoke, why would that be a flunk ride? That was just a, because he wanted us to, to get the thing on the ground with minimum fuel. He was a veteran of, of Korea. Okay. And those guys were always out of gas, and they would come in and they'd do a power-off approach. Really? You know, they come all the way back and fly a real tight pattern and get it on the ground to let everybody else, because other guys are hurting for fuel more than you are. Yeah. So it was just a relative situation, and he he learned how to fly that way, and he wanted me to learn how to fly that way. But it was it was not really the right thing to do. Uh, for one thing, I pitched into a crosswind that was kept me very close to the runway, and when I had the, I knew I had to be very delicate with this airplane. It was a hard wing, 86 Fs. Later on, they had leading edge slats, but this one was a hard wing, and it it didn't do any stall warning. It just quit flying, and uh, I was the ninth guy that this happened to in 1954, just one year. The ninth guy, and this was in September. So almost one a month, they lost one of these guys in final term because they were teaching it that way. But it was under another command, air training command, 
the airplane was only worth a quarter of a million dollars. So it was, uh, you know, you got to learn how to do it right the first time. Yeah. And uh, I think it was it was a wrong thing. They changed it when the one under tactical air command, and we were flying different airplanes by that time anyway. But the the eighty six was an easy airplane to fly, but they wanted you to fly it to its extreme uh, performance. When we were just learning how to fly it, we should have worked our way into it a little more gradually than let me use power and not be afraid to because I might <laughs> crash out of the So you had a hard landing. And we know well, I, I landed about uh, uh, the power on an 86. Once you run the power up, it took about eight seconds for the engine to spool up. Oh. By that time, I was on the ground. I crashed. I was able to land on the, the gear, and the gear was wiped out. And I went across the desert until I came to a stop, uh, about 1,200 feet, going across bumps and ditches and cactuses and so forth, and cacti, I guess is the word, <laughs> and came to a halt, and I was uh, kind of knocked out from hitting, and my, I damaged my, I had a lot of facial damage from a uh, visor that was on the helmets in those days, and I cut, cut both eyes, and uh, I hear this voice yelling at me to lean over, I'm going to break the canopy, and and uh, I don't know what he did it with. He must have had an axe in his uh, jeep, but he was out there, and uh, I couldn't see who it was. He said, "When you," he lifted me out of there. He said, "When your feet hit the ground, run." And I just ran, and somebody grabbed me and put me in an ambulance and went over to the hospital. And I'm laying down there, and they're cutting off my suit, uh, my flight suit, and uh, damaging my bandage in my eyes, and they sewed up my eye <laughs> eyelids. I had stitches and both eye lids mostly mm -hmm. and uh, so anyway uh, I said who was the guy that lifted me out of there and they said the biggest guy you'll ever see so many years uh, many weeks later I was going out to the base to get my eyes examined again and getting treated they were putting stuff in, in my eyes my wife was a nurse retired and she was uh, putting stuff in it at home in my eyes because uh, they were they were all uh, in disorder anyway uh, so I, w I went out to the base, and afterwards I stopped for a beer on the way home. Uh, I was getting almost ready to get released for flight again, and uh, this guy came in the door, and he stood by me at the bar. I was having a beer, and I said, <laughs> "I said, sir, do you have anything to do with the accident on the 7th of September? He said, is that you, boy? Well, how are you doing down there? <laughs> he was a giant, and he had a beautiful woman with him, his mm -hmm. wife, and I became acquainted with him then. And he was a, just a marvelous guy. But that's, that's how that started. I bought him a beer for saving my life. He got an air medal, or a soldier's medal for saving my life because he got on the airplane while it was still burning in the back, back end. What was his name? Jake Manch. Jake Manch. Jake was also a co-pilot on the Doolittle Raiders, bombing Tokyo in a B-25s back in 1942. And he was there at Nellis towing targets with a B-25 that we were shooting at for uh, air training, air gunnery, uh, with our 86s. He was towing targets in a B-25. So he was doing what he was known to do. So anyway, he, he, he was a good friend uh, because of what he did. And, uh, he was also the first guy on the scene when my, the other fellow in my carpool, he, he panicked because as the fireball came over the canopy, well, he was still on the ground. He aborted and skipped, and the, and the airplane was burning. And, and he panicked and ejected himself, and he just went up and landed right by the airplane. And Jake happened to be out at that end of the field, the takeoff end. I'd been crashed on the other end there. Now he's on the other end, of, and he's got him, and he drags that seat away from the airplane because this could blow up here any minute. Yeah. So he saved two of us. Uh, he didn't get a medal for saving Don Metz's life. Although he did, because he didn't have to get on the airplane, and that was the criteria for that medal. So he just dragged him away. But the pilot ended up paralyzed then, huh? Yeah, he died. Uh, I had, uh, he was paralyzed for the rest of his life, and he's passed away since then. I, I, I've been in touch with him mm -hmm. as a family. So you crossed paths with Jake again then, right? Uh, when I came back to Nellis after an assignment to Texas and an assignment in Korea, at K-55, it was after the war. I was flying 86s in Texas and in uh, Korea, 
I was assigned to Nellis, and now they're flying F-100s. And while I was still at Texas, I got two rides in an F-100, C model. And then I was transferred along with some other guys to Korea. So uh, then I, my next assignment was back to Nellis. So I said, good. So I, I got there, and they, they, you, you usually sign in at personnel office. You say, I'm on the base now. So we got two choices. You can be the commissary officer or a uh, supply officer. I said, no, I, I'm a fighter pilot. And just pretend like I haven't signed in yet, because I still got another day or two of leave here. So I got an appointment with the fighter group commander, who was a colonel who had uh, killed the first mate in Korea, by the way. He shot down the first mate, <clears throat> and he was a great guy. And uh, anyway, he, I reported to him in a military manner, and he said, what, is, what, am I, what are you doing here? I said, oh, sir, they're trying to make a commissary officer of me, and I'm a fighter pilot, and I know that I can fly in your fighter group and be one of your best instructors you could possibly have assigned. And I was really laying it on when he, he picked up the phone and he says, Roy, I'm going to send a guy down there, try to see what you can do with him, and let me know. He says, if he's, if he's not working out, we'll get rid of the son of a buck. <laughs> so, so I went down there, and, and after I finished my training, I started uh, uh, teaching the F-100 to other students. I didn't have them pull the power back at uh, <clears throat> idle in the pitch either. <laughs> but I was uh, nominated to be the uh, the pilot uh, instructor pilot of the month the, uh, in the first class I had. So that, that rang a bell, and it, it helped me. So I spent a lot of time in Ellis uh, as instructing. Then I went to the Fighter Weapons School, which is a little elite uh, organization that teaches people how to teach people about fighter armament and how to kill you know, guns, bombs, rockets, whatever the thing was capable of carrying, and did that. And then I was uh, about ready to be uh, sent overseas again because I'd been there four years. And uh, President Eisenhower had just declared that there'd be no more dependent travel overseas. So I would probably be sent to Europe or someplace else instead of the Far East. And I. And I wasn't going to be able to bring my wife, and I'd already had a remote tour, and that was kind of challenging. I was over there a year, we had a baby, she lost another baby while I was over there, and I couldn't get back for it, lost her father. So it was a hard thing uh, for us, personally, and I didn't want to get another remote tour that fast, so I said maybe I could try out for the Thunderbirds. At least I'd be home every once in a while. We're on the road a lot, but we, I get home almost every week, you know. Or, uh, so she said, why don't you try for it? And I lucked out, and I did, so I spent two more years there. But the funny part was I started training in January, and that's when the Kennedy became the president, was sworn in, and he negated that rule about dependent travel overseas. He said, no, we're going to have our dependents with us wherever we can. So I, I said, well, well, she said, look, you've already started training. Go ahead and stay with it. You know, don't don't bow out of it now. So I did, and it was uh, ex you know a great experience uh, doing that. And you, then, you, uh, how many you, how many flights did you have as a Thunderbird? Uh, you know what? Uh, I it was it was hard to say. Every every day that we were at home, we'd fly twice a day, and in each one of those we'd do two air shows: a flat show for bad weather, and then we'd be lighter, and then do a high show. We we flew four shows every day. We were uh, out on a remote training area while we were home. And then the next day before you left, you didn't fly. Then you'd go out on a trip for a week or two weeks, or uh, we went for a month to South America. So, uh, and we flew every day uh, uh, there. So I, it, the number of flights, I don't know. Uh, I flew a lot uh, every day uh, that we weren't just departing. To go somewhere. Tell me what it's like to be. A, I mean, it seems like the Thunderbirds. It, the precision would be just very demanding. It, it is that, and it's something that the, the training period. Uh, and I, we were my, my my leader, and I, and the slot man. It's a guy that flies behind the leader, and I used to fly the left wing, and there's a right wing. So it's a diamond shaped formation, basic, and then we do variations on that. But. Uh, um, while we were training, I was a new guy, and the lead was a new guy, and the 
former lead was going to come out and watch us one day in the F model with a new narrator at our training area. And they crashed and died. I think they were both watching us uh, and weren't looking at the ground. Anyway, it was sad. And so now we're, we're not even through training and we've lost the guy that's teaching my leader how to do this thing. Because there's a, the leader has the challenges. He's got the biggest demanding uh, role. We're just fall. We get used to the formation stuff uh, after, uh, you know, being very rough for a while and finally you learn how to stay there pretty steady and use some trim techniques that help you stabilize so you're not doing a lot of gyrations just to stay with him, to try to keep it where you're not making any moves that the crowd can see. We want to make it look easy, but it's hard to do that. And, but it was hard work, but that, it's, it was harder in those days than it is now, I think. So how does, how does the leader, what, what kind of demands does the leader have that the rest of the guys on in that? Well, he's got to, uh, you know, if there are winds that are uh, involved at the air site, the show site, uh, he's got to try to keep the the show center where the where the people are. Okay. Uh, uh, if you have a wind going one way or the other, you've got to compensate for it because the wind will drift you if you don't compensate for it. And you can. Uh, we flew the worst winds we ever flew with were in my home state of North Dakota. The winds were 50 miles an hour on the deck when we took off. Well, we were all over the place. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Well, you were talking about flying as a. In, well, for, let's go back and catch the. Okay, the, the good. J, the, I, I the got J. off your subject. There. No, that's fine. That's we're here just talking, you know. But uh, you, you, you ran into Jake later. Then it was after you came back from Korea. Oh yes, uh, that's right. Uh, and I was an instructor there, and uh, and I used to meet him. Uh, and I, I went down. To, he was our base ops officer, and he was still. Uh, they, we weren't flying with uh, uh, B twenty fives anymore, but he was working around the base, and he said, I'm going to get checked out on the T-33, which is a jet trainer, a two-seat trainer that we all trained in initially in, in jets. And uh, we always had a couple of those at every base that guys like he could get involved with jet aviation. And he said, I'm going to be a jet pilot. He says, I'm a little worried. He said, I'm so big. He says, uh, I, I, I'm worried about getting, getting my knee, kneecaps cut off if I have to ever eject out of an airplane, because th there's an instrument panel and uh, we all kind of scooch back. And anyway, uh, to make a long story sadder, uh, he was flying in the back seat of a T-33, and as they were entering traffic, the engine flamed out. And the guy in the front seat zoomed as high as he could to get some altitude to start air starts, which never caught on. So he said, we got to get out, get out, get out. He wanted him to get out first, but he was getting so low, the airplane was going to crash, so he went ahead and got out. And Jake ejected, I learned later, but the, he was too low. The chute didn't open, so he was killed. And it was a sad thing for the whole base, because he was the guy that played Santa Claus at Christmas time for the kids on base. Uh, his wife was right there with him. They didn't have kids. And again, he was a dual little raider. And uh, it was a real that was, it was, everybody was in mourning, and uh, I'll never forget that. There's a big housing area now at Nellis Air Base called Manch Manor. It's a new housing area across the highway uh, that was better than the wary housing we had, but uh, at least he's honored in that way. I always think about him when I go by when I'm out there for a reunion or something like that. Yeah. Well, the, uh, the, Thunder, the Thunderbird... Flights. You said you were down, you all went down to South America, uh, and, and from what I'm reading, the the altitudes down there really presented a challenge. Oh yeah, well, uh, we, uh, the, well, I, we did a show at uh, uh, the thirteen thousand three hundred foot elevation at La Paz, Bolivia, and we couldn't land there because uh, they said that there there are rocks and things on the runway, uh, gravel, and and they, we suck those things up in jet engines, and they. They'd, break our engine and we'd flame out and we'd have to <laughs> have things go wrong. So we, we took off from another base uh, 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 in uh, Chile, Chile, Arica, Chile was just a little base we operated from and uh, we, we flew with tanks because it was a long way to Bolivia mm -hmm. to do an air show and we had to do a flat air show. We couldn't do any over the tops 
flat show is you stay pretty close to the ground, you do rolls and horizontal kind of move, changing formations and the crossover is the same. We do things so to, to keep the, the show pretty much what it is, except it's less dramatic, a flat show. Is, and uh, so we did that and recovered back at the, in uh, Arica, Chile again. So the altitude, the, the rarity of the air, was that, a, was that what was causing some of yeah, that? Yeah, well, if we had tanks on, which we usually fly clean, uh, clean airplanes. Mm -hmm. Tanks are degrade your performance, your ability, the Gs, or everything else that you need to, to do over the top. And when you start at 13,000 feet, and you're going to go up to 20,000 feet probably, the, the airplane is mushy, people can't see it anyway. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but but it's, uh, it's a different world. Uh, and those high elevations. We did a, we did one in uh, uh, another base, which will come to me. But uh, it was ten thousand feet uh, elevation, ninety six hundred, ninety six hundred, and the air uh, the airport was ninety six hundred feet long. So it was this, and we found out that the the true airspeed limits on our tires were exceeded at that elevation. We had a guy flying slot with me who was an engineer oriented guy, and he was always working the numbers. He said, we're violent, we're going, if we get a blown nose gear tire on here, we shouldn't be surprised because we're exceeding the, the max speed before we lift that nose off. Mm -hmm. But I was at 10,000 feet, and uh, we did high shows there, clean. Just, but they were kind of mushy on top. When I say mushy, the air is thinner, uh, the response that you get with a given a movement of the stick is less. You have to move it more to get it to do what you want it to do. That seems like that would be a little dangerous in a tight knit formation like what you were flying. Well, it, it's we, we just uh, it, it was second nature to us. We spent so much time like that together yeah. that it was almost second nature, and it, it came. It was just it was more it was more difficult to fly alone than it was on the wing. After a while, <laughs> did you all? I mean, you spent a lot of time together and flying together. Did, did you still keep in touch with some of these? I do. Uh, I do. Uh, there's a there's a my leader uh, who was from Tucson here uh, after we retired. Uh, he's passed away, and uh, the guy that was flying. Uh, well, I had two right, uh, three different right wing men. Uh, the guy that I started out with, he just had a year to go, so. The next year, I had another replacement. He didn't want it anymore. He, one year was enough for him. So the third guy came on, and so I was uh, in for his training period. So I was, uh, I flew 188 air shows in front of people, uh, and I don't know how many flights there were total. There were probably 300 flights because we flew, we flew twice, twice a day when we weren't doing air shows because <laughs> we're always training a new guy or there's a trying to coordinate something. We started out with just one solo. We got a, into the two solo thing, and that took more planning, training, and repetition on all of our parts, yeah. not just the two solo guy. Because mm -hmm. they had a coordination problem with us, and we wanted, didn't want to interfere. So that was another element of the training of new guys that was was challenging. I just, for the, for the uh, anyway, that's the only way to say it, I guess. Well, you said you flew, you, you took, you were out in formation someplace and you had an opportunity to fly the Thunderbird formations or whatever over your hometown in North Oh, North. yeah. Well, <laughs> we were flying from Minneapolis. We'd done air shows, a couple of shows, and we're going to go to Minot Air Base, North Dakota. And they have never, the team had never been there. And they just opened up this new SAC base. that B 52s there. And so we're over my hometown and, uh, Hoot Gibson, our leader, said, uh, Hawes, don't you live around here somewhere? And I said, oh, I used to live right this road that we're crossing, uh, 30 miles up at the end of it there. And he, he said, well, he canceled out the uh, instrument flight plan. He says, well, let's go down and, and take take a look at it. <laughs> and and I said, well, whatever you do, sir, don't don't just make one pass over town. Everybody will say, what the hell was that? And we're gone. <laughs> so he said, okay. Jerry was a solo pilot. He said, Jerry set up for an opener. So he peeled off and, and he opened up the show with a fast pass. And we came in and did about two thirds of an air show over my hometown of 713 people uh, down Main Street. And uh, it, it was really something because uh, my, uh, I, uh, my folks were there and everybody else that I ever knew uh, was there. 
And uh, there's still a few people alive that remember it, uh, or being there. I got some cousins that uh, still I'll be seeing next month that they were there. Uh, but it was interesting to do. We didn't do the bomb burst. We didn't want to give the whole show away. So when we when we uh, started back, I said, Lee, I'd like to make just a slow pass down the main street and see if I can see my folks. And I saw my dad on the right side with a, he had been in the barber shop and he had the barber robe around his neck. And my mother was across the street in front of the store. And as I was about halfway, the town's only four blocks long. I was right in the middle of Main Street, and unbeknownst to me, the right wing men peeled off and came up underneath me oh, and did a roll and climbed out. And it's, it made me jump because I wasn't. He didn't say anything about it. But anyway, my uh, my, my my dad came over to pick me up. My, we were going to we were going to fly in mine out the next day. We were we but we used to go to children's hospitals and schools and. Uh, talk to the people that couldn't come out to the air show mostly we went to a lot of children's hospitals and that yeah, that was that was designed to keep us from getting the big head because uh, that was emotional to see that some of these poor little kids that were in very tough shape uh, with bad conditions that, that they may not be going to survive and this it, it brought us down from the reality of what life is really all about Anyway, I didn't have to do that the next day. He said, why don't you go home and uh, explain to your people in town what, we, what we're doing. <laughs> anyway, and uh, so we did. And uh, <laughs> he said, we have to stop and say, apologize to uh, Casey Sign. He's a guy, he had a little store at the end of town. And he was standing out in the middle of the street uh, watching the whole thing right in front of his little store. And when the guy that came under me came across Casey's sign. He hit the deck because he was pretty damn low. <laughs> and Casey looked, showed me his hand and he says, look at that. And they were all scats uh, from hitting the asphalt. And, uh, he, and he was telling me about all the damn noise and the dot around. He says, hey, kid, you want a banana? Because he used to tell us when we were little kids going by his place, hey, kid, you want a banana? And he'd give us bananas on our way to school. He's that kind of a guy. And so, anyway, that was an experience I'll never forget. Uh, and uh, people still talk about that back there. That was pretty awesome. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So, what did you do between the, so you did some training when you came out of uh, West Point, and then you ended up going into Thunderbirds. And well, oh yeah, I went to, to primary training at, uh, in Malden, Missouri, and I learned how to fly the T-6, which was a trainer that had been around for a long time. It was a very good airplane, easy airplane good airplane to fly. Then I went to uh, basic training, which was a T-28, a little bit more advanced, and then the T-33, the jet, at, at basic. And we flew most of our time there, and at, at the end of that year, it was a year of training stuff, uh, we got our wings. And uh, then we went to whatever you were going to specialize in. Uh, we were going to Nellis. The group of us that selected Nellis went. Some guys went to all-weather uh, uh, intercept uh, outfit training and so a lot of guys went to bombers or cargo airplanes or propeller in those days. They didn't have any jet uh, <laughs> cargo airplanes in those days. But uh, so we were at uh, Nellis and that was uh, really about a two month thing and I had my crash so it took me a while to uh, recover from that and uh, get back in the program and then I went on my way to Texas and then Korea and then back to Nellis again. And so, so Texas was more training. I'm, yes, I'm it was. I, well, it was, a, it was an operational base, but I hadn't, we, they, we, they quit teaching gunnery at Nellis when the guy's wings came off. So we were flying around in formation with a 3G max limit, and that's not enough to do gunnery. you got to get at least four to recover from, the, you know, they just stopped gunnery. So I didn't have any gunnery training. I went to Texas, it's an operational unit, so I was always doing the, the secondary duties around the squadron because they, I didn't know how to how to shoot and they didn't have time to tell me. So, <laughs> anyway, a disadvantage. I, I was glad to get out of there and I went to Korea and uh, just a small, uh, on this point, 
there was a fellow there in Korea in my outfit, and he lived in the same hut I did. We had uh, huts with about ten pilots in each each one. And Uncle Dan Elliott was uh, my bunk mate or next to me. And I said, Dan, I don't know how to strafe and do gunnery. He said, I'll meet you at the bar, four o'clock. So the bar is where you learn things. Yeah. I'm going to blow my nose. People are honest about what's going on around them, I guess. When you and get... and uh, he taught me, he sat on a bar stool, and he got a wet bar napkin and his pencil out of his pocket, and he was drawing diagrams about what, what the pipper is. That's your aiming device, your visual reference for aiming. On, a, on the site, and he'd talk about how to work the, the pipper up toward the target, have a little bit of forward trim in, relax a little bit and fire. And I, I qualified in strafe in just three missions, which is pretty good. But, but he taught me so well, and, and now they, uh, they, they don't have uh, bars, uh, officer club bars anymore. Oh, they don't? But that's where all uh, the real good stuff took place uh, in the old days. <laughs> that's how I learned to strafe. <laughs> So, were you, so you were strafe uh, capable, uh, capable when you went to Korea? Then? Yeah, I was. Yeah, we, we had to be over there because we were flying us. Uh, we sat on alert because the Chinese or the Reds, the, uh, the North Koreans were still. We were still uh, like this. We had a no fly line, but we'd go up and patrol, wait for them to try to come across so we could shoot them down. But we. They were trying to get us to go across. So this is after the war. It was after the war, a... but uh, the the truce arrangement was such that we we still had to sit for a possible uh, engagement with if some one of those guys decided to come across the line. You, you so, realistic realistically expected that something could happen. Yeah, it, we had to have a certain amount of us on alert every day, yeah. and to uh, in case that happened. So we always had about. Uh, I think we had four airplanes on alert all the time out of the each each squadron. So that's how that was. So uh, how long were you in in Korea then? Just a year. A year. Exactly a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, th that's when I went back to Lao Nellis and uh, the rest I kind of already covered. I think on that. Yeah. But Nellis days. So I mean, trying to. Kind of catch up with where uh, at what at what point was it that then you went to uh, Kadena? You were in Okinawa. Oh yeah, when, when I got off the, uh, the team, the team, the, thund had a, the Thunderbird uh, team you talked about. The, the Thunderbird, yeah. When I was through the, the team, okay. I checked out on the 105. That was my choice. After a year on the Thunderbirds, the Air Force tried to get you where you wanted to go after that, mm -hmm. because we lost. Uh, we didn't take vacate leave. Didn't take any furloughs during this two-year period because we fly all year long. So you might get a weekend off somewhere if you were sick, but we couldn't afford to get sick. Really, we didn't have intense. any spare jobs. Yeah, we lived it right on the edge. So uh, that's uh, so I went to 105s right at Nellis, and then uh, from there I was sent to Kadena and uh, spent. Uh, that's when we got involved in the, in the. Uh, the war before I left there. The, this in, in Vietnam. It, yeah, the Vietnam thing started uh, while we were there. So what, what year would that have been? In 1965. 65. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it started in about February. We uh, we were sending guys down there, small, like by squadrons, to operate. They're, they knew there was something was coming up. I don't know how. I don't remember the detail. You say since you sent guys down there. Now, where to uh, to uh, Thailand. To I've got 105 bases were in Thailand. I should have mentioned Takli and Krop were the two 105 bases. And then later on, uh, there were F-4s at uh, Da Nang and uh, Ubon and uh, Udorn, Udorn uh, as the forces built up over there. We were there at the beginning when it was just the start of it. And we were had a real steep learning curve because the people in headquarters didn't know how to get us to do what they we were supposed to do. Uh, and, what, were you, what were you supposed to do? Well, in other words, they they over they they tried to over control our movements. Uh, when we really got serious about this, first of all, I was on a first raid of uh, into North Vietnam. Really? We we were flying at Laos. Period, mm -hmm. and then suddenly we're going to go into North Vietnam, and we went into the southern reaches of 
North Vietnam. And there were ammunition storage areas there that we started with. On the very first mission, I think we lost four airplanes. Uh, one guy uh, from another outfit was uh, taken prisoner. Uh, another guy had to eject uh, in our uh, group, uh, but he was picked up uh, by us. The other guy got picked up by the bad guys, so he was taken. He was the first Air Force uh, prisoner of war. What was his name? Of that air. I think of his name in a minute. Was it Pete something? Or it, it might say be in there. Uh, he was a, an F-100 pilot from uh, that had oh, been out of Dan Ang. Purcell. Well, Purcell was, was in our group. Uh, oh, I see. He got shot down later uh, 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 in our experience down there. Uh, my wingman got shot down, and Percy got shot down at the same time. We had, that was the day we lost uh, six airplanes. That's a, that's a pretty high price to pay. It is, uh, yeah, and it was uh, uh, three of the guys got killed in the course of their ejections, and uh, two guys were taken prisoner, and my guy was the only one to get out that day due to good fortune. I knew exactly where he was. I had radio contact with him. It was about 30 miles uh, west of Hanoi near the Black River. It was on the west side of the Black River where he finally went went out and he got picked up by a, the first jolly green giant. Mm -hmm. One. And he just called it that. I met that guy because uh, we had a reunion. My wingman, our flight surgeon who was always involved with us, myself, uh, the two A1 drivers off a ship that escorted the chopper in to get Frank picked up. Frank Tulo was my wingman. And uh, he, spent the, he spent the night in, up at, uh, in Laos, in northern Laos, because it was getting dark, and he spent a night in a crate, an engine crate, to keep the, so the rats wouldn't get on. These were Americans who were living in Laos, way up north, on a, they called them a, 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 a Lima site. And these were observation and communication points, and, and they, they were some secret agents and other things that we were not privy to know about in those days. Uh, operating in these places of uh, way. Uh, but it was we, American military, though. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and so he spent the night there, and then they he was down to, to Vientiane and uh, waiting for something to happen. And a four-star general happened to be having breakfast there, uh, the commander of PACAF, and saw Frank. He said, well, what, "Who's that guy?" He said, "Oh, he's the guy who got shot down yesterday." Well, get him in here and get him some breakfast. So Frank came in and sat down with his general, four-star. Commander of Pacific Air Forces, and he asked him all about the thing, and he said, well, what can I do for you? He said, I'd like to get back to my outfit. He said, where's that? He said, Karat. Oh, I'll take you down there, my 135. So he, he took him down his 135, and there was a little reception for the general, to, because coming into this place, and they had a little band for him, and they were playing, and, and uh, the general told Frank, he said, you go out first. So he let Frank in his dirty little torn up flight suit with a bandage on his forehead. <laughs> All the people were wondering, what the hell is that little guy? <laughs> and it doesn't look like a general. Then the general came out later. Anyway, we were glad to get Frank out of there because it was a bad day uh, to lose that many people. Did uh, you change strategies or anything after that? Or? Well, yeah, we, we went uh, the very next day. Well, let's see. We had... It, it, Every time we tried something new, uh, we would go down and try to talk to the people who were designing the frag orders for these missions yeah. to try to influence them. So I did uh, when the very first one when we lost those four airplanes. Uh, the commander, well, a very famous guy uh, uh, that I'll talk about later, uh, and I, Robbie Reisner, who was an ace from Korea, uh, and he's now a squadron commander. And I was the ranking guy in our uh, squadron, and he was in the sister squadron. He said, let's go down and talk to him. So we got in a couple of 105s and flew to Saigon, where the, the headquarters is, and they're designing all these missions. They said, hey, too many airplanes in there in too short a time. We get running into each other and getting in each other's way, and, it's, and they're shooting us down. <laughs> yeah, okay, so you now, found a cause then. Huh? And, we'd, and so the next time, he and I were... Uh, designated to be a coordinator. So he and I took off first, 
And as the airplanes came in, we, we'd, lo we'd located the target, and we'd lead them in and act like a forward air controller, and we'd mark the target with either rockets or strafe, to say, this is where it is, and then these guys would bomb it. Mm -hmm. So we just had light stuff, the rockets and guns, but they were dropping 750-pound bombs on them, eight of them, uh, on these targets. Uh, so anyway, that's uh, the only time I ever got hit uh, in an airplane was uh, was on that mission, but I didn't even know it. It was way back in the tail. It was just a, a round that went right through the horizontal stabilizer, just left a hole. <laughs> it didn't explode. <laughs> this is good. Yes, that was this good. Was good. Well, there was another mission uh, over uh, the, uh, there was a bridge of some sort. Oh, the Tanwa Bridge? Yeah. Yeah. That, that was, was, it, was a, that about the I same time, that, or was it was that about the same time? It, it was uh, with within a few uh, weeks or months. Uh, uh, we were down there twice for, and uh, this war started it up north on the first time we were down there, and then it got more intense, and we were getting closer to Hanoi on the second time. Okay. And this uh, this one was uh, was on the uh, east coast of, of uh, North Vietnam, and it was a major bridge. It had uh, it was a, a huge bridge. It had a rail and highway, and uh, it was a major communication link. And they, they'd lost an airplane, at least one airplane on this thing. The Navy was losing one. We'd lose one, uh, and somebody was getting shot down on the Tanwa Bridge. It had another nickname, but uh, I happened to be in a flight that uh, first time we carried three thousand pound bombs, and we carried two of them. I was with a squadron commander. And we uh, we dove in on that uh, that one, and the only picture that there was a guy that was fragged, uh, ordered to fly along and get pictures of our impacts, so we could learn something from it. And uh, he got my impacts, which there a bomb landed on each side of the bridge, and I just got the bridge wet and killed a million fish, but I missed the bridge. And the reason I did is because these bombs were. They hadn't been certified to be carried even yet. Oh. This was kind of a, a high risk from an engineering point of view, not from a life threatening, but just an engineering. Uh, we we were there's such a clean bomb. We rolled it. We were way at a high altitude when we rolled in, and and we still were going to release around 5,000 feet. But we started up so high that I was supersonic when my bombs came off. I didn't know that I was, but I, I just was rolling, and I've been used to having eight bombs, and, and you know, you never really got very fast, but with these slick bombs, you got them. <laughs> and you're I was, I was, along, yeah. I, when I came off the target, I looked, I was doing 1.1 Mach, and of course the bombs probably hit the shock wave that forms on the aircraft around it, and it just threw them out there, because the bridge was a wide bridge, but I was able to get one on each side of the bridge at, with a 20 degree cut at it. You know, I wasn't going down the bridge or 90 degrees, I was about a, and it, anyway. So that was a, a Bill Hosmer uh, blunder. I struck out on that one. <laughs> but that was, wasn't that one of the, uh, you were having problems with pilot, you losing pilots over that bridge? Or? There were a lot of people that were shot down, not uh, from different outfits. Uh, you know, we had the F-4 guys that shipped, uh, uh, air, uh, the Navy guys off of carriers yeah. were uh, getting shot down there. Everybody was losing somebody on that thing. Well, tell me about this guy named Mer Percy. Uh, he, 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 was, uh, he was a guy that was assigned to my flight. He was our squadron weapons officer. Then I had to write his ERs and his effectiveness reports and things, and he ended up being a good friend. But uh, he was flying with the squadron commander, and the squadron commander, uh, let me put it this way, he was shot down, uh, Percy was shot down, Bob Purcell, and he was a prisoner for seven years and three months, so we didn't know that he'd made it out of the airplane. He was flying, uh, they were flying in a close formation, low to the ground, dropping napalm on these targets. And what happened was, well, I asked him when he got out of jail, uh, what happened? He said, well, he said, my, I, I got hit somewhere back there, my controls, I could move the whole stick and nothing was going on. And we're flying down low and I'm flying in close formation. He said, I just got out of that damn thing. He didn't say anything. Well, by the time he hit the ground, 
this airplane of his just went off to the side and crashed. And this guy said he went in and there wasn't a chute. Well, the chute, the chute was way back there two miles. Oh, I see. Okay. So we all thought we had a chapel service for him that night at uh, Karat, at back at Kadena. They had a uh, funeral service for him. Uh, he, they had him in his hometown, a funeral for him. And, and a guy that was flying uh, the same day I was, when my, wing, this, you know, my wingman got shot down the same day he did, uh, he was flying a week later on the Tanwa Bridge. Okay. And he got shot down. And he broke one arm in seven places and the other in six places, so he was, his arms were absolutely useless. And he said they threw me into a place uh, in North Vietnam a holding place and he was laying on a bunk and, and he saw on a wall a little carving that said Percy 727 and that was the 27th of July that Percy got shot down so he said I was the only guy in the world that knew Percy was alive and there wasn't a damn thing I could Couldn't do about tell it. anybody <laughs> and so he was he was a POW and, uh, and later just to give you an idea, his arms never, you know, uh, they tried to do what they could with redoing his arms uh, when he got out of jail. Yeah. But uh, I said, Did, how, does it, how do your arms go now? And he said, you want to see me salute? And I said, yeah. He said, this is, his, <laughs> this is all I can do. <laughs> so that's enough. <laughs> and he passed away uh, now, too. Oh, yes. yeah. there, there, we've, we've lost a lot of those guys that got more prisoners. I think that they lost a lot of their their longevity just by being in that horrible place for the, all those years. They're, they're going fast all around us every day, it seems like. There's somebody else that we heard of that's not here anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you led an adventuresome life, I'll tell you that. While you're... Now, you did more than one tour in Vietnam, though, did you not? Or... Well, I really, uh, my first tour, uh, they didn't have a, an idea what a tour was. Huh. When I got sent back to the States, I had 60 missions on the 105. Then they decided that 100 missions over North Vietnam was going to be a mission, I mean a tour. But I hadn't reached that and some of my missions were in Laos. And, and, and I didn't keep track, we didn't keep track of where, the, you know, geographically, we just kept our count of our mission. Yeah. So that meant I didn't do a tour and I, I would eventually have to go back there to get a complete tour. And of course the war was going on, I was at TAC headquarters. I had an important job, and uh, when I was able to, I went back over there. But uh, they weren't going up north at that time anymore. And what when, what year was it? Uh, they weren't going to North Vietnam at all. Was that in the seventies then? Or? Yeah, yeah, and uh, it was I guess sixty nine is when I went over there, yeah. and I went back in the F one hundred because I had a lot of F one hundred time, and I was now a lieutenant colonel, and so I was uh, pleased to uh, get a. Uh, be assigned a squadron commander of a F-100 outfit at Tuiwal, which was in the Two Core area on the coast, okay. about straight east of Pleiku. Was, uh, where, I don't know where you were with relation to that, but this was uh, in, in South Vietnam. Well, so we flew uh, close air support and, uh, and stuff in Laos as well, interdiction. That, yeah. uh, well, I was in uh, I Corps up north of Da Nang. Oh, okay, yeah. You know, we were up in that area. I see. Yeah. But I was I didn't get there until sixty seven and by then it seemed like the F fours were Yeah, but they were up there then by then, yeah. Yeah. At, then they, um, Let me see, there was a, a mission I, I guess where you, you said there was a road construction project where you had like thousands of these guys. Oh yeah, that was back in the F one hundred uh, days. I was uh, I was assigned there we used to go off in flights of two. Uh -huh. So I had a wingman, and we were going to work a target we'd been designated, and the controllers uh, of the the time said, we're diverting you from your target to uh, take a steer to head and contact a forward air controller, a misty forward air controller that's mm -hmm. on the scene. He's got a target, and it was near dark. It was almost evening time. Sun was going down. and. Uh, uh, he said, he said, ordinarily we mark a target, you know, with a, a rocket. Mm -hmm. He says, I'm not going to do that. He said, there's about a thousand people down there. They're, they're all in rows and they've got shovels and they're, they're, they're taking dirt from 
higher up the mountain and rebuilding the road that some bombers knocked out a yeah. few days ago. Yeah, this is so, in North uh, Vietnam. This is in Laos. In Laos. So, Laos. Okay. Yeah. And because uh, we're not going anywhere to Vietnam now, North Vietnam. Okay. Nobody's going up there except some recce people once in a while. But uh, so anyway, uh, we had high drag bombs and you could uh, really put those uh, really wherever you wanted them. Yeah. So he said, just put it in the middle of the smoke. And so I did it and I, I had my wingman offset and come in on a little different heading. So if anybody was shooting, that usually you try to don't follow each other because the shooter at one and hit the other one. But uh, so he was, uh, we, we delivered it, just one quick pass, but because now I'm, I've got a fuel problem, I got to get home. So I couldn't stick around and do another pass or spray for anything. He just said, okay, I understand. Well, they tried to figure out how many people, how much credit, how many KBA, kill by air, should we assign to this? Well, he was talking with this guy in the back seat and said, how do you, do you think? He said, well, that whole damn, they all went down the mountain and the, and the dirt was all over them. He said, you must have buried it. A whole bunch of them. Uh, how many do you think? I don't know. <laughs> so, I, well, we didn't know either. So the next morning I was a squadron commander and we'd go, intelligence would hand us a, uh, what our squadron did the day before. Not just my mission, but all my other guys that flew that day, what, what they did. So I would report that to the staff and the, at the stand-up briefing in the morning. And the wing commander said, how do you feel about that uh, three to four hundred kill by air? And I said, well, it sounds like a strange number, but I said, I don't know. I said, uh, he said there were a thousand people on the roadway, and the roadway just went down. So some of them lived. Oh, how many? So it's purely a spam of the night. Now it came dark, so I said, I don't know what it is, but they let it go through, and uh, it was uh, three to four hundred KBA. That's, I got the highest body count of any uh, air strike uh, in the whole war. Really? That was, <laughs> Whether it was or not, we don't know. <laughs> yeah, well, it could have been more than that, too, yeah. you know. <laughs> and probably was. We still kid when we get together. That guy that was the forward air controller, I know he's a good friend. Now, let's see, what do you think? <laughs> Now the Misty flights were more, were they reconnaissance? They were forward air control, uh, they, uh, they were they were spotters, they, 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 they would go out and they knew the terrain. Mm -hmm. they, they stayed in uh, certain areas and they, they would recognize any changes. New tracks, there's been some vehicle, uh, the, the foliage doesn't look right. Well it was a camouflage oh. series of trucks because it didn't match the, the foliage that they'd been seeing day after day. And, they, and they, they were really good. And uh, uh, Don Shepard, of course, was in that business. And uh, I knew a lot of the guys that were. Uh, a lot of them got shot down. A lot of them didn't make it because it was hazardous. Because they spent a lot of time over unfriendly territory. Uh, Close to they the didn't ground. watch you there. Close to the ground. That's that right. That was misty. Yeah. That's true. Well, hat, hats off to that group as well. Yes. You know. And then. Uh, when was it that you, that you actually ended up at Davis Montham back in? Oh, okay. Uh, or, or after uh, I, I left, uh, I left Vietnam. I was assigned directly to uh, the Lake and Heath, England, in an F-100 outfit, okay. and I was uh, I was became the assistant DO director of operations. I made I made colonel in the, while I was in Vietnam. I did. It wasn't effective until I got to England. But I got there and I became the DCO of uh, the 48th Fighter Wing. It had F-100s, that's three squadrons of F-100s. And we operated there, I did our gunnery training in Italy, uh, did uh, maneuvers uh, all over Europe with, you know, uh, for exercises and training uh, uh, employments. And so uh, I was there two years and they, and they were about to convert to F-4s and I wasn't gonna be able to be there long enough to get checked out in the Air Force, so a, uh, I was reassigned after just two years in England instead of three to the, our Air War College. I hadn't been to the Air War College yet. So I went to the Air War College for a year, and then uh, from there I went to Davis Moth, and I was assigned to, I was actually requested by the commander of Davis Moth at that time, who knew who I was, but I had never really met him. Uh, so he 
I was assigned to Davis Monthan as his vice commander. Yeah. He was the commander, and we had four uh, A7 squadrons here uh, and a, uh, and a uh, drone squadron, which uh, had C-130s, helicopters, and drones that uh, would go out and, you know, they would operate from a C-130. The guy would control them to do reconnaissance and do things that drones do. Well, that was one of the early uses of drones. Yes, it was. Yeah. And uh, anyway, that was what the outfit was. And my uh, boss got promoted to Brigadier General and was transferred to Luke Air Force Base to take over that outfit. And I was took over the 355th wing as a commander. And I did it uh, for two years, and uh, at the end of that time, I, I realized I wasn't going to get promoted to general like my predecessor had. So I did, elected, with the assignments that I had, I elected to retire, because I had uh, 24 years in by that time. And I, I, I w they were going to send me to South America to I had to go learn Spanish and be a... a, a Exchange officer with one of the South and South American countries. I wasn't interested in. And well, you said you, you had come to the conclusion you weren't going to get general, uh, but some some of that was of your own making. I'm sure it was. Uh, you know, you turning down the the, the, educate, the war was it the war college or what was it that you? Well, I it's, I think it's attributable to the boss that I had in England. Okay. Because uh, a friend of mine who. Uh, who was flew on Thunderbirds, by the way, who was later the Thunderbird lead, and then he was made a Brigadier General, and he was at Colonel's assignments at the Pentagon. And he called me up over in England, and he said, what in the hell are you doing over there? I said, I don't know, what do you What do you mean? He said, I've got an efficiency report on you that's worse than anything I've ever read in my life. And I said, well, you know, this guy and I just never really saw eye to eye. He's the only guy in the Air Force that somehow I just couldn't relate to. I tried to do everything as a deal that I thought was right, but he didn't like me, obviously. Yeah. And I found out some other things about him. Uh, he's dead now, and I'm happy that he's gone. <laughs> the world's He was not place. a fun guy to work with. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I attribute it to him. But it's not, you know, it was because of, maybe there were other, I've never had any chance to read what he wrote about me. Yeah. They don't let you read those things. So, uh, so you decided been, that you were going to retire. He must have been then. very justified. And <laughs> he, he left a big mark on my records that I couldn't ever erase. Never overcome. So nobody ever forgot it. I did an okay job here with the wing. Everything was fine. But, uh, but this thing back here. It was time to go. It was time to go, yeah. yeah. So where did you go? I went to Montana. <laughs> I said I was going to grow a beard and make my own beer and get a flying job. And I did all three. <laughs> Except I couldn't get the flying job I wanted. Mm -hmm. And I've been flying single engines all my life, and I, I went to a guy that was uh, uh, flying for uh, the Forest Service up there. They were dropping, uh, they had some uh, old World War II Navy fighters that they were using to, to get into tight places with, with uh, slurry and things to put out fires. And I said, I've been dropping stuff out of airplanes for a long time, I can do that. <laughs> and the guy said, well, I'll tell you what, why don't you get a, have you got a multi-engine rating? And I said, no, I flew single engine all the time. He said, we ought to get a multi-engine rating. So I got in the GI Bill, and there was right in Missoula, Montana, where I was, at the airport, and I, uh, I, got, uh, I got rated uh, in a single, uh, a twin engine. Mm -hmm. And so that was enough to uh, theoretically get a job with these guys. So I went back and I said, okay, I got my license. He says, yeah, but we're not hiring. So, <laughs> So, That's not supposed to be how it works. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there was a guy that I knew uh, on the Thunderbirds who uh, flew the support airplane. Uh, he wasn't a fighter pilot. But he said, hey, you ought to come down here to Wichita, Kansas, and fly citations. He said, uh, it's a beautiful little uh, airplane. It's with a Cessna. twin jet. With Cessna. Cessna aircraft. And we were, uh, he was working for what they call the demonstration pilots, the demonstration flight. We would demonstrate the capability of each model of the citation. Actually, I flew the one, the two, the three, that they didn't have a four, the five, and then they went to the 10. But I flew the first four models that they were doing over a uh, uh, about a 12 year period and flew all over the world uh, in that, uh, that airplane. I delivered airplanes to South Africa, 
into uh, New Zealand, China, uh, flew into Russia. I didn't sell them, uh, deliver an airplane, but I flew uh, some Finnish people down there for a Saturday night uh, party, I guess, and uh, enjoyed Moscow on Saturday night myself. <laughs> Quite an uh, awakening. Experience. How so? How so? What was so special about that? Oh, uh, it was just uh, the vodka was good, and uh, and uh, it was just different to be there. I studied uh, uh, Russian at uh, at West Point as a language for two years, so I could I still had a little vocabulary, so I used a little bit of it around and bedazzled some of the Russians so that I could understand what they were saying about me. Wow. That sounds like the Cessna job was a yeah. right up your alley. It, it was really a good job. Uh, it was uh, we we took. Uh, company pilots from some, you know, whether it's Sears, Roebuck, or any major company, fly with their uh, their department of aviators, and then often we would fly ourselves with their executives. They might be along, but we'd be flying at both of us both seats. But we used to let them get in the left seat, and we'd go out and shoot landings, do stalls, do whatever they wanted to do, short fuel landings, whatever, and. Uh, and then we would fly with the executives and try to be as smooth and, and economic as we could to take them wherever they wanted to go. And it was a fun job because it was something new every day and a new location. And we were gone a lot, but uh, my wife was glad about that. <laughs> so everybody's happy. Yeah. <laughs> you covered quite a bit of ground on that too, you say. Uh, oh yeah, uh, really, yeah. Okay. And then, uh, you see, there was, in Japan, I guess you were. Was that also a site with uh, oh, well, Cessna? Oh, I, I, I forgot about that part. Uh, uh, while I was flying for Cessna, I, I, I uh, demonstrated the wife of a Japanese guy uh, at a and their aviation advisor, a Japanese man from Tokyo, in a local flight at uh, at uh, Wichita, Kansas, and they bought the airplane, and they requested uh, that I when it's all topped off and everything, to fly it to Japan. And I said, sure, I'd love to do that. So I was getting ready to retire from Cessna anyway. Mm -hmm. I thought this is suitcase life, and, you know, I was getting oh. burned out, burned out. Yeah. But I said, sure, I'll deliver that. And I delivered it, and uh, he wanted me to work for him for a while, fly with his a Japanese pilot who was good English speaker and had gone through the program, checking out in the citation back at Wichita. So, so we flew. Uh, he had places in uh, Hawaii, in uh, New York City, uh, in Tokyo, of course. And he, he would go to all over the Far East with uh, the social stuff. It was mostly his family, but sometimes just the, the boys would go down to Hong Kong to have a, have a little blast sometimes. So we went down there with him. And uh, it was fun, and uh, we f we flew uh, about two years with him. And he, he he said all the time you have to stop on every island to catch gas. How come? I said you got to get a bigger airplane if you don't want to do that, sir. So we bought a a, a Bombardier uh, <laughs> up in Canada. It's a it's a thirty five hundred nautical nautical mile airplane. We were flying a two thousand mile airplane, so we couldn't go quite so far without refueling and he got he didn't like that so he bought this other airplane and we went up there and checked out in it and brought it over so now he got two airplanes so the boss that I had at Cessna I said do you want to come out and fly with me he said yeah I do so he came out <laughs> and we were, we were both flying with and, and this guy was a wonderful guy to work for he bought a house for my wife and I live in on uh, on the uh Wildlife Golf Course in Honolulu, where they had the Hawaiian Open. I lived right there. I had a swimming pool. I had four bedrooms, three baths, and it was a house that I lived in for nothing. It was part of my pay. <laughs> that sounds pretty. And good. I had my wife, and I had my kids come over with her, their girlfriends, uh, and spend some time with us while we were there. And then suddenly, their stock market dropped from twenty-five thousand something to down to about nine thousand, whatever that. They were, and he 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 said, I, "Sorry, I have to say bye bye." What year? What, what year would that have been? Just let me think a second here. Be about nine, uh, eighty, 
90, 89, 90, 91 or 92. Early 90. 91, 92 in that time frame. So uh, how long were you in that, say, that Hawaiian? About two years, about almost two years, two years yeah. And it was a delight. Uh, good gosh, uh, I, I could be at home in North Dakota in my log cabin on the Canadian border, practically. And uh, they would say, you can live wherever you want, you, uh, but have a place for you in Hawaii. But we wanted to be up there in the summertime because our family was up there. Yeah. But but he'd say, call up and say, uh, Bill, Mr. Ota, I want to go to uh, Hong Kong Friday. Can you come tomorrow to uh, Tokyo? We meet you. So I get... I, I call up, make the reservation. I flew business class. He he paid me two hundred fifty dollars a day when any time I was away from the house, plus fourteen hundred dollars a month just to be alive, plus all my expenses. I didn't have to. I was scot free on that. Was the nicest job I ever had. <laughs> I'd still be doing it if I weren't so old. <laughs> yeah. Well, if he was still making money someplace, uh, it wasn't anyway, it was a great experience. And, uh, so I quit and I just. Uh, Tried to concentrate on golf and whatever there was left. Yeah. So then he went bankrupt and you Yeah, were and I never knew if he recovered or what, but he was a wonderful guy, had a beautiful family. My wife would fly with us on some of these trips, and uh, the kids were learning English. They were Japanese kids, and, and she was helping them with the English. So there was a, there was a, f a real good relationship uh, with us and his family. I was at his home. For a dinner, he had uh, two uh, garages, uh, 18 cars in each garage, every kind of a car I've ever heard of from every country I ever heard of, uh, including Rolls Royces. Uh, and he had a he had a a, a uh, chauffeur that kept all the cars operating and running. And every once in a while, he'd uh, take one of them and drive. What business was he in? <laughs> he was uh, he was born rich. Uh, he was a child movie star in Japan. And then he, uh, as he grew up, and he showed us a film clip of, of him when he was a young boy. And I, could, I couldn't understand it, but he was crying, and his, something was wrong with his family. And, and then he, he got into business. He had, a, uh, he had some uh, sushi, sushi houses mm -hmm. in Tokyo. And then he got into a construction, a home, let's see, it was a, a home company. He had uh, plots of uh, uh, real estate. Yeah. With homes, Cassini homes, uh, and and so he was was in real estate. He was very very rich. Uh, there's no doubt about it. it uh, the airplane that he bought was uh, in the twenty million bracket, and the one he had was in the ten ten million bracket. And uh, it and he had them both gone, and he had crews on all of them, and he had a, he had some helicopters too, and ships. He was just a very rich guy, and, but he was a very nice guy. Yeah, you might Google him sometime and find out where, whatever happened to yes. him and stuff. Tell me a little bit, there was one term in here that really kind of caught my interest, the horny toads. Oh! <laughs> 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 what, what is well, that? There, there were, uh, there, in my company at West Point, mm -hmm. there were about seven of us that we kind of were, we were a guy, we were a, we were the guys. Yeah. We kind of saw each other, and we just clicked. And, and uh, after we graduated, we started getting together. Uh, two of the guys uh, died. Uh, one got killed in Vietnam, and uh, the other guy died of an uh, illness. But so there are still uh, four of us. Five of us. There were five of us. And uh, he, one of those, just died. So there's still, still four of us. And uh, we. Uh, one of the uh, we were making jokes about it that uh, we get together at somebody's house starting about 19. I was still flying citations, and that's the first time we got together at in El Paso because that's where I was, and that's where they, they one of the guys lived there. He was a commander of, of Fort Blitz, he was a two star general at the time. Mm -hmm. So he now lives in Colorado, but anyway, so we were together with our women and we talked a lot, and we'd say something about a bait, you know, from the old days or something. And one of the women said, you guys are just a bunch of old horny toads. <laughs> You're just like a horny toad. So we just picked up on that. Up that. We became the toads. <laughs> so there's four toads left. That's funny. That is funny. She, she named us 
Because we talked about our girlfriends. <laughs> Is there anyone that you that we haven't talked about that you'd like to mention? I, I, no, I, I think I've really uh, covered about everything that makes any sense. Uh, I'm just, uh, uh, I, was, I was glad to serve when I did and how I did. Uh, when I look at what the guys are doing now and what kind of airplanes they've got and everything, it, it's just not really the same. Uh, so I, I feel very good about my life and uh, I owe a lot to my wife uh, in going through all of this stuff and she's, uh, she's with God now, but uh, she was uh, throughout all of this stuff I'm talking about, she was right there. She and I slept together in diapers. Tell that and story, diapers. tell that story. My dad and her dad uh, were bachelors in northern North Dakota. They lived in towns 20 miles apart, but they were both mail carriers and they met at a place for a meeting of mail carriers and they got they got to know each other and they started palling around and uh, they got married about the same time. My dad married a nurse and uh, Pat's dad married a, uh, a uh, school teacher, musician. Well, they got married in 1929, both of them, and my wife and I came along. I'm three weeks older than she is, mm -hmm. and we were both born in the town between where she lived and where I lived, called Rolette, North Dakota. Rolette, good name. And so we, we, we had the same doctor, uh, our mothers had the same doctor, and and then our folks would get together to go dancing at one town or the other, and they'd put us in the crib together with a babysitter, and they'd go dancing or whatever. So that, we slept ever since we were before a year old, and then we got married and after I got out of the academy. And, and we were married for 57 years, so it was a long life together. She was an angel. Started her Now she is an angel. Now she is an angel. Is there anyone else? That, uh, that there was a uh, the only e time that you ejected. Have we talked about that? Uh, well, it was uh, I was on the Thunderbirds at the time. I did eject. Uh, we were uh, we were flying up at uh, a Navy air station in Rhode Island, and uh, we were just uh, we'd taken off from Wright Patterson in Ohio, and we were just arriving, and the lead got permission to. Uh, make some maneuvers over uh, the Navy air station on arrival because tomorrow we're going to do an air show there. So that sometimes that brought a little attention to, hey, here they are. And we used to do a couple of arrival maneuvers, a couple of rolls, solo, do some stuff. And uh, as I pushed up power to to go, uh, the engine quit. It just, it just quit. And uh, so I tried to get some altitude and started doing some air starts, attempted air starts, and I'm trying to get to where I can also do a dead stick at the airport because we're kind of close but not quite close enough. And the right wing man came off and he was talking me through these so to be sure I got all doing one thing to get it started and it still didn't start. Mm -hmm. So he said it looks like, and I couldn't get to a, a low key point which is a, a flame out point in the pattern that you can get to the runway in all probabilities if you don't screw it up. But I couldn't get to that point so I just rolled out and I ejected uh, at about 500 feet in a descent and there was a wide open field across this road that was coming, you know, real busy traffic on right outside the air base uh, and I was right over the cars and I was afraid I was going to get run over so I pulled on one side of it and uh, landed in a tree about uh, 20 feet off the ground right by the side of the road. All these cars stopped and everybody came running over to the tree I was in, and I really needed to urinate, uh, but there were all kinds of people out there, <laughs> men and women and children. And I was trying to get out of this tree, and it took me about 15 minutes because I was tangled up, and it was not an easy tree to deal with. I, I can't find one here that looks like it, but I finally made my way down to the ground, and uh, somebody from the base had by that time arrived out there in a pickup truck and so saved me. But uh, I, all my clothes for the rest of the trip were in the airplane, which blew up when it hit the ground. I could hear it explode while I was still in the chute. And so all my clothes were in there. And, and somebody said, yeah, I could see her. She had shorts and a tuxedo uh, hanging in this tree up there. Nice combination of, uh, 
of a wardrobe there, yeah. hanging in a tree. <laughs> but, but your comment about you didn't want to urinate on your would-be rescuers, I thought, you know, just that showed a lot of willpower yeah. and self-control. Well, I had to, I controlled my bladder okay that time. <laughs> Are there other people that, uh, that, that you remember, you know, that you kind of still, when you think about them, it kind of warms your heart? Yeah, it's true. And I keep in touch with a lot of people. You know, the doggone computers make it possible. I'm in touch with hundreds of guys that I used to fly with. <laughs> Some of them are gone now, but their wives. We have a WW club here in Tucson, a widow, widower's club. <clears throat> we are about six fighter pilots that have all lost our wives. And there's six widows of fighter pilots. There's 12 of us. I think there's 13 now. And we get together every other Thursday night for dinner at a different restaurant here in town. And these uh, these people are, uh, I knew the guys of three of these widows. Yeah. Anyway, and uh, and of course, uh, 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 it's, we, we have this fun. Uh, every, well, you have a common bond. That's right. Yeah. And we we're all in the same, and we keep looking out for each other. I mean, uh, you know, if somebody's sick, we be sure they're okay. That's awesome because you have a, well, a community of That's like really true, I, and, 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 and it's expanded. The, the, I'm in touch with the horny toads. We were just together in uh, Colorado last month for a, for a weekend because one of the guys is now he's got Alzheimer's and he's starting to lose it, and we just want to keep in touch with him as long as we can. His wife is an angel uh, taking care of him, but you know, it's the realities of being as old as we are. I'm coming up on 86 now, be later this year, so things are, you know, <laughs> the finality it makes itself uh, obvious. Every day is special, though. That's right. Every day is special. Yes. And uh, any other folks or people or guys experience? Well, I, I've got a, I've got a girlfriend that I'm crazy about. Uh, she is the sister of one of the horny totes. Uh, uh, Joe Wilson is a classmate. Uh, an interesting thing about uh, that family. Uh, her father was uh, a prisoner of the Japanese. Uh, she was she was with uh, General Wainwright. He was with General Wainwright when uh, we surrendered to the Japanese in the Philippines. Oh, I remember that name. MacArthur left them there and said, "You know, last as long as you can." So they were taken prisoner. Uh, her dad was on two ships that our Navy sank on his way to Japan as a POW. And he survived those two things and finally got up there and he was a prisoner for the rest of the war. And he was at uh, our graduation at the academy. So I got to meet that gentleman. And, uh, and uh, it was, to me, he was uh, my hero. I mean, to survive all of that and come out and looking good. And, and uh, he's, of course, now he's gone. But, but his son, my classmate, uh, for, let me, one more. They had an older son who was a West Point graduate. Mm -hmm. her, her dad was a West Point graduate. Her older brother was, and he was a battalion commander in Vietnam, and he got killed over there. He got killed, tried to, he was on a helicopter that got shot down, and, and some of the people were injured, and he was trying to help them get out when he got killed, when the thing blew up. So he was killed. Uh, her young brother was a classmate, and he was a battalion commander over there, infantry. And he was an I-Corps for most of his uh, time. And uh, he's still alive. And then it's, she is the baby of the family. And uh, when my wife passed away, I, we were having a reunion six months later at Joe's house, Joe Wilson's house. And he said he was going to have his sister uh, join us for some of our, our activities. And I said, I wonder who in the hell cares. He, he was bald-headed. His ears stuck out. He had squinty eyes and a horrible nose. So I said, who gives it that? So we're having a party, and he's got his neighbors. We're all having a drink, and all the toads are there that are alive. And, and I see this little gal come walking to the door. I said, it must be the neighbor complaining about the noise in here. And she started to go around the room and saying, hi, I'm Joe's sister, Liz, and hugging everybody. And I said, holy smoke. And I'm way over here. And she came all the way over to my side, finally, and, and she said, Hi, I'm uh, Liz, I'm Joe's sister. And she tried to back away, but I just hung on to her just a little bit longer. And she looked up at me like that, 
and that was it. I've never let her out of my sight. <laughs> <laughs> you don't, out of my mind's eye. Don't let a good thing out of sight. <laughs> <laughs> so we've been going together now for six, over five years. Wow, that's nice. And, that's uh, nice. and I, I call her every day, uh, and she's, she's just a delight because uh, I'm just a guy that needs to have somebody in my life. You know, she doesn't want to be married. Uh, she doesn't want me to live with her all the time. She wants me to come and see her, and she comes here. We've been to Alaska. We've been back to the Academy for my 60th uh, reunion. Been to Washington and been all over the place together because she's just a wonderful companion. And uh, she, the, there's pictures of her all over there. You'll, you'll see she's a fine-looking lady. <laughs> well, see, she and she came from a family of heroes, it sounds like. Yeah, that's and, true. And, 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 it's, uh, and uh, that's an honorable situation, uh, what her Very cool. guys did. Tell me about your experience with the VA. Uh, you were mentioning while we were talking about the air, the jet engines being so loud. And well, yeah, I've had, my head, my hearing was really pretty bad, and I, I was getting uh, uh, actually uh, there were other things about with my body. I had some some pains here and there, and they they gave they changed my my rating, you know, my retirement rating. Uh, with because of the restrictive movement in one of my legs, uh, it's just uh, I think it was really being that uh, either the ejection or the crash. There were a lot of things in the crash that you can't put your finger on because uh, your whole body hurts when you're in an aircraft crash. And then finally, something lingers after everything else is healed up. I say, gee, that must have been from that that one, or maybe it was the time I rolled my dad's car. Could be that too. So. <laughs> We didn't cover that we story. Don't cover. <laughs> <laughs> My dad will turn over in his grave and talk that. But uh, but the VA has been. Uh, well, uh, yeah. My uh, these hearing aids I've got now are are theirs, uh, and I lost one, and I and I said I just lost one of them. And I can't. I I move a lot. I travel back and forth, and I just lost it. So they got me another one. Now I've got two because I found. The one that I lost in a uh -oh. pajama pocket, which I don't usually wear pajamas anyway, and I, there I had it <laughs> in Texas, I guess. <laughs> I took it out, put it in my pocket, and there it was. So I got I got a spare but blue you, one. But you had pretty high praise for the VA. Yes, yeah, so I, I I got a change from ten, when I retired from the Air Force. I had a ten degree, ten percent disability, and that was based on hearing and uh, some. Uh, arthritis that they said you yeah, you got a little bit of that, but I, I got it reevaluated when I got older, and uh, because the arthritis part of it became more of a factor, and they reviewed it and gave me more physicals and examined me and X-rayed and and increased that to uh, forty percent and from ten, which gives you know it, it's monetarily it gives you less taxable income. Right. than it would have otherwise because uh, they take it out of your my my retirement air force pay oh i see yeah so it, it, it's compensated anyway but uh, but i haven't been out there now i've got a classmate that's out there in, in a permanent state uh, he's got a uh i think he he's lost his stomach now he had stomach cancer but uh, he was an army uh, infantryman no engineer engineer mm -hmm from the same company I was in at the academy, but he's uh, I go out and see him once in a while. But he just, he's a widow and... Life goes on. Yeah, same age and all that. Anyway, there's, uh, everybody else in my life has been good to me, except one guy, and he's, he's gone now. And he's gone. <laughs> so if you, if you had the, uh, the grandkids in front of you, or if you had, you know, uh, say, young uh, class of uh, men or, or women in, anymore, you know, uh, w would you recommend the military to, to any of these folks? Well, you know, it, 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 uh, of course my Air Force is around. I've got a, I've got a grandson who's interested in flying, who's had a, a few civilian just exposures to it. Mm -hmm. I, I just sent him some money. He's now in a new location. His family moved to a town where they have an active airport, an active uh, 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 training program for pilots. And I, I'm trying to get him to research for me what, what this is going to cost. And he's just a, uh, 
he's going to be a junior in high school. He's about six foot two. He's a fine looking guy, and I'm real proud of him. I just was with him. Uh, his uh, sister, my granddaughter, just got married, and we had a big family get together up there. So I got acquainted with him again. So I just sent him some money and his uh, sister, his baby sister, to establish an account for something to use for flying. She, I said, maybe your sister wants to fly too. Who knows? She's a little younger. But I'm trying to get them into a capability to have some options in their off time. I said, you know, you might think about getting a job at an airport. A lot of guys that I know started by working around, cleaning the... Uh, the hangar floors, mm -hmm. washing airplanes, uh, and, and by doing that, getting a free lesson, so many hours, yeah. and, and uh, trading off uh, with your own manual labor and interest in it. And, and you, that's one way to do it. So he's thinking about that. But uh, uh, as far as the military goes, it, it, of course, uh, this is a bad time. I think the military isn't really in its best configuration for a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but the, the Air Force isn't anywhere near what it is. Uh, we've got a guy that, that's flying F-35s up at uh, Luke Air Base in Phoenix, near Phoenix. His father is in our, our Friday pilots, Bill Pitts. Hey, he's got a son that's an IP instructor pilot in the uh, F-35, and he's been down here and I wasn't there the day that he brought their helmet down. The helmet cost three times as much as the Air 86 that I crashed. It cost 680 some thousand dollars. It, it gives them a capability to look out the bottom of their airplane, for example. <laughs> they can see exactly what's under them. We have to, used to have to roll up to see what was down there. Yeah, but, because all the optics are on there. Yeah, but they've visor. got all this stuff, they can plug it in and it's, it can see all ways in all directions, oh my God. It's, it's magical. But uh, but they're, the guys are not, uh, they're 700 fighter pilots short in the Air Force now. And they're, they're, the, the academy guys are not going into fighters like they used to because they can't get enough flying time now. The airplanes are are wearing out. We we don't have the funding to keep them in commission. It's it's a uh, it's not a good healthy situation right now for pilots because of the economy and uh, other factors that are too much for me to try to grab a hold of. Uh, but a lot of it's got to do with our leadership right now, in my view. But that's another point. But the uh, a lot of the work is being done by drones too, the the, the reconnaissance and that kind of thing. Yeah, the, the yeah yeah the, the females that are there. The, yeah, they sure. sure. Yeah. Now we've got uh, uh, Martha McSally is a friend of mine who was a squadron commander out here. She was the first lady to be in combat over there in the A-10s when she was a squadron commander here. She deployed over there, yeah, she's and she's congressman. now a congressman, uh, yeah. congresswoman from uh, this district, and uh, and she's a good friend. Well, we've had events in her behalf to get uh, get her financial uh, support and so forth. You know, as I sit here and I kind of look back across your life and all the flying that you've done and the world that you've seen and everything, that it, it was all made possible by flying. That's right. And that would not have been possible if your dad hadn't sent you to that school, a different school. That's true. I owe everything to the sacrifices that my dad and mother made back in the 30s and yeah. early 40s. Probably never stopped being grateful for that, do you? No. Uh, and uh, and uh, when I talk to my cousins and my brothers, I've got two brothers. Uh, one of them who is a priest, uh, not a priest, but a, a minister, Luther minister. And my other son, uh, brother, <laughs> he's just a stay-at-home guy, and he just reads. And uh, up at either, he's in North Dakota. The other guy just told me by phone he's he's going to get married, and he wants me to be his best man. I said, oh, yeah, just give me the details. Where am I supposed to go when? I'll be glad to be your best man. Yeah, you the following orders. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, they, they, that's the other part of my family that uh, are treasures. Yeah. yeah. Well, Bill, I want to thank you uh, for taking time to do this interview. Uh, Mike, thank you. It's been uh, it's it's an ego trip for me. Thank you. Uh, it's and thank you for your service. I really uh, thank you for your service.
Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah.